So we're going to turn to the next phase, and I'm going to put some questions to the panelists. And I guess uh, I'll first say that I, I can see that Jerry has offered a clear counterweight to what was, in general, a pretty upbeat set of uh, just comments by the first three panelists. And so, Todd Stern, I'm going to uh, let me suggest uh, rephrase what I think are at least two criticisms of the Paris Accord that come from Jerry's comments. One is that, yeah, we have these pledges, the INDCs, but they're not binding. So there's no guarantee that they'll be binding. So one of the questions is, is there a way to improve the prospects that countries actually meet their commitments? Part of, you know, what's next? How can we do that? And the second is that, uh, I think Jerry's saying that even if all the pledges were met, it's not going far enough. And there are different numbers there, but it doesn't get you to two degrees, or let alone to 1.5 degrees, which has been a more recent target. So is there a way that the US can take action going forward to try to make the pledges more stringent as we go forward in time? And um, where, where do you think that can happen? Uh, yeah, well, first of all, thanks for the question. Uh, and um, let me also say that it is um, a great pleasure to be, uh, to be uh, roundly criticized from the, I don't know if it's the left or the right or where that is, but from the, from the direction of, uh, of seeking more ambition um, from, uh, from, um, from your side of the political aisles, Jerry. So I, 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 I a crazy won't. world. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the political imperative in the United States. I, I'm going to get to your question, and I'm not going to go off on a, on, a, on a tangent here. But, but the politics of this issue is even harder than you know, getting the technology right to, to solve the problem. So at the moment that we that we get. Uh, broad political support across, uh, across the partisan aisle in this country will be able to do a great deal more. So I, I'm actually quite serious. I, I, I don't agree with all of the criticisms, but I welcome that perspective. Um, so on, on your specific questions, Larry, uh, uh, first the, on, on the pledges not being binding. Look, uh, politics is always the art of the possible. Uh, it, there was no way to go forward with an agreement that was built on the, essentially the Kyoto structure of developed countries act and developing countries don't act. That was a, to me, an absolutely clear core principle of, uh, of our approach, number one. Number two, we knew that there would be a, a, any, any significant number, probably a very significant number of developing countries who were not prepared to do legally binding uh, 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 commitments with respect to, to their targets. So that the only way that you were going to get that is if you went, in fact, back to the Kyoto structure where, uh, where you had developed and developing countries uh, separated. The other thing uh, is that, uh, that so to, in order to ensure broad participation, we thought that we needed to have uh, a structure the, the way that we did, which, which is essentially a legal hybrid in which many elements of the agreement are legally binding, all of the elements that have to do with accountability and transparency, the accountability for your targets, but not the targets themselves. Uh, the broad participation that we sought for this agreement also included the notion that we wanted the United States to be part of this agreement. And in order to have the United States be part of this agreement, uh, it was a, at least a, uh, a, uh, a useful thing to have an agreement that, uh, again, includes everybody else and is structured in such a way that, uh, that the president could, uh, could uh, cause the United States to join it as an executive agreement, uh, which, uh, which we are able to do now, uh, uh, partly, uh, uh, partly based on the kind of legal hybrid that, that I talked about. So that's uh, on the on the issue of, of there being pledge uh, 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 of the targets being non non binding. On the question of uh, of uh, the stringency, again, look. Uh, well, I'm, I'm actually asking: Is there ways that the U.S. can take action to try to increase the chances that the pledges will be met going forward to, to 2018? Well, again, I, I think that that the the <coughs> fact that we have a binding. Uh, that we have a binding system of transparency and accountability is, uh, you know, is a is a pretty good start. Uh, and uh, and even 
you know, the notion that, that targets need to, be, need to be legally binding in order, order for them to be meaningful, I think is really not true. I mean, if you look even at the, uh, at the, the existing targets that, uh, that we are living with now, which don't apply to all countries, but apply to whichever countries, it actually applies to all the developed countries and a, and a fair number of developing countries, that followed the Copenhagen and Cancun meetings in 2009 and 2010. Now those are completely non-binding and, and, the, and the transparency regime is also non-binding. There's not anything binding about that regime. And yet you have countries working very hard in order, the United States and China and, and, and you know, a, a, a great many countries who took on those targets are working very hard to meet those targets because when countries and countries at the presidential level make commitments like that, even if they're not legally binding commitments, they care about, they care about uh, meeting them. There's, there is, there is a, a great deal of reputational pressure that leads countries to want to do that. It's also true, by the way, that if you had legally binding targets, there is no way under any, uh, any uh, uh, scenario in which there was going to be binding enforcement with penalties and punishment uh, as, part of, uh, as part of this regime. No country thought that was, uh, that that was in the cards. So, so uh, you know, you, you go back to, to Kyoto, you, you, you look at Canada. Canada took a legally binding uh, target under Kyoto uh, and, and uh, realized at a certain point that it wasn't going to meet it. And the fact that the agreement was legally binding didn't lead Canada to, to, to do that. So I, I think that there can be way too much focus on this question of whether uh, targets are legally binding or not. In terms of stringency, uh, I, th I think that, first of all, the fact that we only got halfway there in one year, uh, you, you can look at that glass as half empty or half full. I think it's actually quite a positive thing that, that, uh, that uh, the estimates went from 3.6 to 2.7 in, uh, in one year's time. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, um, you have a structure built into this agreement where every five years there's going to be a stock take of where we are against the targets and against the goals that we've, that we've taken on. Uh, and there's going to be a process of ratcheting up uh, country commitments, uh, each, uh, each, a review each five years. So some countries like us uh, are, are put ourselves on a cycle of new targets every five years. Some countries uh, put themselves on a, on a cycle uh, at least till, till 2030 of a 10-year target, but even for them, after five years, they've got a review, they've got to look at, at, at the existing science, the existing technology, and so forth, and, and either say, you know what, in light of all of this, we're going to increase our target, or we're not going to, but here's, uh, here's why. And I think that, so that period of five-year reviews and cycles, I think, is, uh, uh, and, and global stock takes, is, um, you know, is, I think quite strong. And look, I also think the signals from nature are going to get worse and worse. I mean, we know that. I mean, we, we've got a problem that's not going away and it's getting worse. And I think the fact that we have uh, a, an agreement that is, uh, that is lasting, durable, that has, that has these regular uh, updates built in is going to put more and more pressure on countries to do more and more. So, you know, I think that, uh, that in, in terms of what was possible to do to get the entire world on board uh, to take important steps forward. I think we got pretty close to what was possible. Thank you. Well, Jerry, you, you, you offered a lot of pe pessimism. I was looking for the, the window of opportunity. <clears throat> and you said that it's for the US to sort of be a leader and introduce a carbon tax. But I'm wondering, what are the political prospects for that? Are there any political windows of opportunity? What can be done to increase the prospects that this can happen down the road? Well, there's a lot of scenarios where it can play out. I think people, for you know, we, we accept the current political arrangement and think that it's been glacial and has been like this for all of our lives, and it hasn't. In 2008, we were this close to having significant, a national cap and trade program. If John McCain had won the election in 2008, he would have brought in enough Republicans and you would have seen more aggressive climate policy than we have at present. Not because John McCain is a more environmentally minded man than is Barack Obama or a more capable uh, alternative president. That's not what I mean. What I mean to say is if John McCain were in the White House, he would have been able to take on enough Republicans to have accomplished what Barack Obama can't accomplish given 
absolute Republican opposition. So we were that, not, I'm not saying, therefore all you guys who voted for Barack Obama, you know, go blame yourselves for this problem, because <laughs> that's not what I mean to say, because even I voted for Barack Obama in 2008, so I'm not, I'm not saying people made mistakes here. But I am saying is that as recently as 2008, the Republican Party was poised to put in the White House a president who took every bit as seriously the climate problem as does President Obama, and who could have easily delivered on it. Because one thing we know about is that political, that voters follow leaders. Voters are sheep. They are not people who tell, put boundaries around politicians. They are the ones who are led by politicians. I'll give you an example of this. There was a survey done a few months ago in which Republicans were asked how they felt about uh, a, a, a single payer health care plan, you know, universal health care. And in the course, the question was mentioned that this was supported by Barack Obama, which it's not quite, but anyway, for, you know, you could probably make the case that at some point Barack Obama said something positive about it. And in the survey, anyway, they found that about 16% of Republicans said, yes, I support single payer. Now, of course, that's what you'd expect, right? Same question to a different set of Republicans, and these were about 2,100 Republicans surveyed on each side, so it was a pretty good sample. Same exact question, except this time when they talked about single payer, it was mentioned that Donald Trump supports it. 44% of Republicans supported it under that phraseology of the question. That tells you volumes about how easily public opinion can be led by politicians who want to lead. So when you ask the questions, what kind of scenario can you see? Well, I could see a scenario in which a reform-minded Republican who understands maybe the climate isn't his biggest issue, but one, he, he is interested in what the oil, gas, and coal, and hydrocarbon sector has to say about this because of a special seat at the table of Republican power. And guess what? Virtually every single major U.S. oil producer is in favor of a carbon tax under the right terms and conditions. I think there's a good chance the coal industry might be in favor of it if you give them enough in return because right now they're on a death spiral and they, right, right now they have a hard landing in front of them. A carbon tax may well give them a softer landing, which is the theme of a speech of a paper we just released yesterday, by the way. Uh, I could see a Republican president looking at that as uh, relevant and doing what George Bush did in 1990. And the fact remains that the Republican Party, I think if certain Jeb Bush or uh, uh, Chris Christie or other establishment minor Republicans actually get into the White House, they understand that the Republican Party has a branding problem. It's popular on some issues, but increasingly looks bizarre to the vast majority of non-Tea Party America. And if you want to rebrand the party, a good place to start is on climate, just the same way that George Bush Sr. saw the same problems in the GOP and tried to rebrand them in 1990 as the party that cared about cleaner. That's one of about nine or ten different scenarios, but I don't have time to go through them all now. But there is reasons for optimism. Thank you. Does anyone else on the panel want to comment on the political prospects in the U.S.? <laughs> I, I have a, a difficult enough time charting the political progress in California. So I, I, don't, I don't think I'll try and comment on the, the well, nationals. I, I, I'd, I'd say just one thing, Larry, which is, uh, this, is a, this is a moving this is a moving target. I mean, I, th I think if you look at polling right now on questions like support for the Clean Power Plan, support for Paris, belief in climate change, belief that action needs to be taken, the polling is moving uh, in a better and better direction. And it's generational. I mean, I mean, this is, I know this is an issue different from some of the social issues that have moved so dramatically over the last 10 years, but, 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 but dramatic move, movement can happen. And I think that, uh, that in people who are relatively younger versus relatively older tend to, tend to instinctively get environmental and, and, uh, problems and, uh, and climate problems. Uh, and so I, the, I mean, the day is going to come, and we're not there yet, when politicians understand that it is bad for their health to be uh, seen as obstructionist on these issues. And at that moment, Congress is going to change. And that's the way it works. And, and, and historically, there has, been no, there has been no cost for politicians to, uh, to oppose or at least ignore action on climate change. And that's going to change. I mean, it's, we're in the process of that changing. Thank you. And I, I just say that, yeah, I think, I think that change can occur more quickly than we anticipate. Um, you know, I was, I was reading about the history of the uh, oil industry the other day, and uh, it, it, it was, uh, well, I was reading that book. I was also reading about Lawrence of Arabia. It was an interesting little story about Lawrence of Arabia meeting some representatives of Standard Oil when he was in the Middle East. Um, and they were there because they were concerned that they were running out of oil. Um, and, uh, this was 1913. 
Um, and the point that was made in the book was that uh, in the United States in 1905, there were 75,000 combustion engine cars. By the time that these uh, explorers were looking for oil in the Middle East, there were one and a half million cars in uh, the United States. It had changed just very, very quickly. Um, or there's a nice graphic uh, that uh, Representative Ken Alex, uh, who's one of the governor's environment advisors, uses. At the Easter Parade in New York in, in uh, 1908, it's all horse-drawn carriages. By 1913, every vehicle in the uh, Easter Parade is a combustion engine car. These things happen more quickly than we anticipate. You can't, so if you build the right environment, if you inspire people to the technological change, it will occur. And so that's what we're trying to do through these policies. We're trying to create that environment that will inspire people to change the technology, to reduce emissions, to deal with these climate change programs. And I'd like to think that in California we're seeing those changes. And that's why we've adopted uh, very, very aggressive targets for uh, 2030 as well. I mean, we want to get to 50% renewables by 2030. Uh, the governor wants to reduce petroleum use in the transportation sector by 50% in that period. Energy efficiency. I remember debates with my father when he talked about how many nuclear power plants we were going to have to have in California to provide energy in the 70s. You know, through energy efficiency, we avoided that. So these things change. You just need to create the right environment, and that's what we're trying to do at this point. So Matthew, you're, uh, the Brown administration, Governor Brown has, uh, as you indicated in your original comments, uh, in your introductory remarks, has articulated some, what many would consider very ambitious targets for California by 2030, 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, emissions relative to 1990. Uh, and as you indicate, uh, AB 32 and, and more broadly California's climate policy is very impressive in terms of the number of efforts going on, the kinds of efforts. It's a smorgasbord of policies. policies. Well, turning to the economics, a number of economists have criticized that, arguing that many, by having so many different approaches, the low carbon fuel standard, the re renewable portfolio standard, other standards as well, in addition to cap and trade, that it's a, not a very cost-effective landscape. That, in fact, if we had more emphasis on cap and trade and less emphasis on these other so-called complementary measures, there could be reductions at much lower cost. So I'm wondering, what is your feeling about going forward? Will cap and trade um, obtain a larger uh, place in the overall effort? Will it stay the same? And um, what's your feeling about whether that is really a, a, a cost-effective approach going forward. I have a, a, a couple of thoughts. I have to be very careful because there were uh, people uh, in the audience today who were at this particular conference. Uh, but uh, I, I, will, uh, I will say that uh, when we started the cap and trade program, we were very conscious of the fact that we needed to really keep an eye on the impact that the program would have on the economy and how it would play out in combination with other uh, programs that we had in California on the economy. Uh, and so we spent a couple of days talking about what we should be looking for, ideas. Uh, as a non-economist, I came away from the uh, meeting with um, and the conference with uh, the sense that Nobody could really tell me what the economic impacts were going to be, but they were all very excited about the prospect of doing research on what happened. <laughs> and uh, um, so I said, okay, we're embarking on this wonderful experiment. Um, let me just say this, that you know, we've received a number of reports about uh, how a combination of the low carbon fuel standard and the cap and trade program would affect fuel costs, for example, or how some combinations of these various programs would affect the economy. None of them have, have played out. Um, now, part of that is because of circumstances that I don't think anybody foresaw a couple of years ago. I don't think anybody saw sub $30 um, oil prices um, a couple of years ago. Uh, but we are constantly looking at the economic impacts and the interrelationship between these programs. We're very conscious of the fact that we need to be aware of the cumulative impacts of these particular programs. Um, and so that's why we do a scoping plan. Um, uh, we're supposed to do them every five years. Actually, we're doing a new scoping plan right now to, to look at how will we achieve these 2030 goals that uh, you've mentioned. Um, so we are doing what we, what we can to sort of 
get a feel for the economic impacts of these programs, how they interrelate with one another, and use that information as we're deciding to, how to go forward. But what we have found out is that it is difficult to predict exactly how these things are going to play out. And so you don't want to give up on any one of them. You want to maintain your options. Um, and you want to be able, well, the, the key, however, is to continue to fine tune your programs, respond to changes as they do occur, and, and be willing to be nimble and be willing to make the changes that are necessary. If you need to do a course correction to make sure that you're not having an adverse impact on the cement industry, be willing to, to take a look at that and be willing to, to bring in that information. It's, it requires constant vigilance, but uh, if you pay that attention to it, uh, our experience so far has been that uh, uh, you can keep these programs going um, and uh, I think in combination they're working very well. With regard to the cap and trade program, we see that as a key component. Um, it's been, it's worked out the way we had hoped uh, thus far. It's also provided, I, I, I should note, um, uh, we're, uh, you know, $2 billion a year in revenue that we are then turning around and investing in new programs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so it has uh, that, um, co-benefit of providing additional funding for a program. So uh, we'll continue to keep an eye on it. Um, uh, and uh, um, we know that we have to, to see how it plays out and how it relates to the other programs. But at this point, there are no guarantees uh, in life, but uh, it is playing out the way we had hoped that it would. And so given that, we see that. And given the interest nationally in carbon trading programs, um, we see that that's still an area that we want to pursue. It's an area that we may be able to uh, pursue with uh, partners beyond uh, Quebec and Ontario uh, who are interested in, in, in continuing their relationship with us in our cap and trade program. We're exploring whether we can do more in a power trading program with, uh, uh, with the Reggie states in the, the uh, east. So uh, we want to keep uh, all our options open. Trevor, I haven't forgotten you, but I can't resist a follow-up question to Matthew. And I hope you'll forgive me, Matthew. I'm sort of putting myself in the role of skeptic in order to sort of bring out some issues that have been somewhat controversial. You know, the allowance prices under the cap and trade program in California have been hovering really close to the floor price, around $12 a ton. And many environmental uh, groups have said this is suggests a that the cap and trade program isn't stringent enough, or that for one reason or another the program isn't doing enough, because uh, we should have higher allowance prices and get more reductions. What is your what's your take on that? What is your reaction to that? Well, uh, you know, the, the key for me is whether we uh, reach our uh, 2020 goals. If we're reaching our goals. Um, I was discussing whether I should reference songs uh, on the way over here. And I, I, I will just say one of my references to a, a song comes from when I was younger, I said, you know, John Lennon and whatever gets you through the night is all right. Um, you know, if we're getting to our objectives, if we're reaching our goals, uh, then I'm uh, less concerned with could we be getting a little bit more from here if we focused on this program as opposed to this program. Uh, so I'm, I'm focused on are we going to meet our 2020 goals? How do we meet our 2030 goals? Um, and so uh, I've heard the discussion of whether the prices should be higher. Certainly if you were doing a carbon tax, I think that you would want to put more of a, uh, uh, a price on carbon. But at this point, we're satisfied that we're making the progress that is necessary to meet our objectives. And that's what's important to me in the end of the day. Okay. So Trevor. Uh, I'm perfectly happy just listening to these guys. <laughs> You're not going to get off that easy. Uh, in your impressive slides, you showed how re uh, various recent changes, uh, including policy changes like the, uh, the tax, tax extenders, have really given a boost to renewables. And um, I wonder if you could say a little bit more of a kind of a evaluative, uh, uh, of, uh, of evaluative nature about to the extent to which you think at this point pushing on renewables is a good investment. To what extent should we be favoring renewables through policy versus uh, continuing? To what extent are these tax breaks and subsidies, in your view, uh, do they pass a benefit cost test? Well, I think the nice thing now about the package, the extenders package, is that we get out of this year-to-year -year expiration, retroactive reinstatement. 
where there's a predictable phase out. So for those who didn't track this, there's a three-year extension of the ITC and PTC and then a phase down. Uh, and then the PTC is gone forever and the ITC uh, stays at there's a permanent 10 percent that was uh, that was capped. And so what's nice about that for the renewables industry is you know they see a point definite in the future uh, where those tax incentives are going to be gone. They can plan business models around it and they can prepare for that point. Uh, so that when we get to the clean power plan, it's going to be whatever the lowest cost way to reduce emissions is uh, competes. Uh, because by 2022, those tax extenders will be gone. The impact, what you can see, though, is having that predictable glide path ha will have reduced the cost of those technologies to a point that uh, once the clean power plant takes effect, uh, they outcompete gas, uh, in our analysis anyway, for uh, 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 under a technology-neutral policy framework. A lot of the discussion up to now is really focused on public policy, government policy, the terrific work that Todd has done to push for, to advance international climate policy, working domestically in terms of the clean power plan or uh, closer to home in California uh, with California's policies. But Trevor, you also mentioned the importance of private sector leadership. And I imagine there are a lot of folks in the room that are wondering, you know, what can be done to kind of accelerate that? Or should we just rely on that kind of having its own evolution? So I had, I was in, as you mentioned in the introduction, to, we had the, uh, or that Charles did, we had the pleasure of uh, coordinating the uh, research team that did the analysis that fed into the Risky Business Project. And so Greg Page, the chairman of Cargill, was one of the, uh, one of the members of that uh, group. And uh, Greg has become a fairly vocal champion of climate policy. And what's interesting about his position, Cargill's position, is they are sandwiched between uh, the brands that they sell to who are getting pressure from their customer base on sustainability and for whom the price premium for climate action is going to be a pretty small share of a Frito if you buy it, right? So there's not really, once it gets that far downstream, there's not really a, a meaningful price difference for consumers, but there's companies with huge brand risk that want to, uh, want to ensure that their brand is associated with sustainability. They've been pushing that all the way up the supply chain uh, to companies like Cargill. And uh, some of the, the brands that I showed on the uh, final slide are companies that have committed to source 100% of their electricity from renewables. Now the challenge is, is that unless you take and once you create a framework that prevents it, all of that positive action by those companies is just reducing the amount of clean energy elsewhere in the economy, right? So you imagine under the clean power plan, uh, Walmart decides to get 100% renewables for all its stores. There's a fixed amount of renewables that's going to be deployed in the market based on the regulatory constraint. And so all that does is shift renewables from one place to the other. So I think one of the big challenges is going to be creating a policy framework that ensures that uh, states, cities, private companies that have either a, uh, an interest in, in, in leading on clean energy because uh, that's what their constituents want, like in California, or because that's what their customers want, to shape that in a way that it's actually driving additional deployment and action and not just uh, you know, moving around deck chairs on the Titanic. Anyone else want to comment on the potential for private sector action? Well, that is one of the reasons why we have the cap and trade program. I mean, it's to uh, encourage uh, uh, private sector to look at uh, ways that uh, they may be able to reduce these emissions without some command and you know control uh, program, and uh, uh, maybe they can profit from it. So we are trying to. Uh, uh, we realize that businesses are an important partner in all of this, and. Uh, uh, it's, it's one of the things we've looked at, um, and we're proud of uh, the uh, support that has been received from California companies. Well, I think there's, if I can, there, there's two things we haven't talked about yet where the private sector is having a huge impact. One, shadow pricing for carbon, uh, which has been driving a number of decisions it, by major corporate actors. For instance, while ExxonMobil may not be the most vocal proponent of climate alarmism, the price they put on greenhouse gas emissions, the price they put on carbon emissions when they look at their own investments is somewhere around $60 a ton. So 
they make economic decisions by including that price in their calculations, and they are not alone. Because they assume there's a prospect of They assume regulation. there is a prospect of future regulation, and these, they don't want to be caught with stranded assets. And, and they, they understand that these are massive, this is a massive amount of capital they're looking to expend, and they don't want to be caught with their you know, pants down if regulation were to come along and that money is not wasted. The second thing, of course, is that market actors likewise expecting a low carbon future are utterly savaging the coal sector right now and they're just the first I think. Coal prices right now, stock prices for coal companies are in the absolute toilet. You could buy the entire coal industry and <laughs> shut them down for probably around eight or nine billion dollars today just based on their market cap. It's trivial <laughs> and it has nothing to do with stated arguments from the coal sector about their reserves about their profitability because people in the private sector and the investment community are looking at that and saying, bull, no way is this going to play out. You're not going to be drilling on public lands through 2030 paying very low prices and seeing increases in production like they're telling their stockholders. So market actors who can look at what's likely to come are having huge impacts here on the energy market. I don't mean to say that that in and of itself is enough to drive policy change because it's not. But it's certainly enough to make a difference, and it's increasingly making more of a difference now when politicians are looking at a future in which even if they're not acting with carbon pricing, market actors are assuming, are making decisions, assuming there's a carbon price and it's having an impact. So we got just a, two or three minutes for uh, this last component of uh, this stage of our, our, our event. I want to pose a question to you, Matthew, but uh, be, I'd welcome comments by anyone else on the panel. And it has to do with the connection between federal and California policy. How do you see the Clean Power Plan affecting what California does? Some say that it is a way of sort of pushing states further, including California, to do more linkages and more interactions with other states. Uh, do you think that the Clean Power Plan, assuming that it survives major uh, court challenges, is going to influence California policy, and if so, how? Well, um, clearly uh, California has been supportive of the Clean Power Plan. Uh, we've uh, joined the states that are supporting the plan and filed an amicus brief in support of the plan. And um, so we see it as a positive thing. Uh, we think we can achieve the targets, frankly, uh, that have been set for California through the uh, Clean Power Plan without really changing our programs at all. So it's easier for us to uh, embrace this plan and say, look, this is what we were going to do all along. Um, but uh, it's nice to have a partner in the federal government. Um, it has encouraged uh, discussion with uh, other states. Uh, we've always made it clear that we are interested in working with other states. And it really has provided an incentive to those uh, discussions. Um, and I will note that even states that are, are, are um, publicly adverse to the Clean Power Plan are looking at what they might need to do to, uh, uh, to develop plans and programs to, to implement that plan. And we've had some very productive uh, discussions with those other states about what we might do together in the energy sector. So uh, we view it as uh, entirely consistent with uh, what we're trying to do here in California. Um, and uh, you know, we've, we've had a good relationship with the Obama administration and, and see this as another area where we can continue to work together.